Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Eric Bubar. Uh, I'm an associate professor of physics uh, and engineering at Marymount University. Uh, and I've been working with 3D printing to make 3D printed prosthetics uh, for a while now with the Enable community. So the purpose of this talk is to talk about what 3D printing can do for you uh, and kind of provide you with some resources that, that might help you with uh, uh, creating devices or any kind of uh, technologies that you might need. So who am I? I'm the Associate Professor and Head of Biomedical and Mechanical Engineering at Marymount University in Arlington, Virginia. I have a PhD in Applied Physics, uh, and I've been an Enable volunteer for about six years. Uh, I will tell you all about what Enable is through the course of this talk. I also develop and maintain the University Makerspace, which comprises a bunch of 3D printers, vacuum formers, VR headsets, uh, microcontroller, mini computers, uh, 3D scanners, a ton of different uh, kind of technology tools that you might have access to at your maker, local Makerspace, maybe your local library or something like this. Uh, and I should note that everything I'm presenting is my opinion and doesn't represent any kind of medical advice or that of Enable in general. Um, so this is, this is the perspective that you should keep in mind. So the abstract here was uh, that I would show you popular 3D printed hands and arms, uh, give you some data about their functionality, clarify their intended use case, uh, and also to be a potentially open discussion uh, on how you can work within makerspaces to create devices that you might want that don't exist. Um, so let's go ahead and, and dive right in. So uh, what was Enable? Uh, important to know a history of kind of how it started to get some perspective um, on, on what Enable actually does. So it was started by these two individuals, uh, Ivan and Jen Owen. Uh, Ivan was a puppeteer and kind of special effects guy. Uh, and he created this steampunk costume for Halloween uh, and had this uh, giant kind of metal hand that was part of his costume. So he put this online and a gentleman in South Africa saw this. And this gentleman had lost a finger, and he thought that uh, Ivan's steampunk design could actually give him a prosthetic finger. So they worked together and collaborated through the internet to give uh, this gentleman a finger, uh, quite literally. And then uh, another mother saw this, uh, and her son was actually missing fingers on his hand. So Ivan worked with a 3D printing company at the time called MakerBot to create a 3D printed prosthetic hand. And this is... Uh, um, the first uh, 3D printed prosthetic hand uh, that was given to this child, uh, Liam, in South Africa. Uh, and this was about 10 or so years ago now. And what uh, another gentleman by the name of John Scholl noticed, he was a researcher at RIT, um, was that people were commenting on this video, these YouTube videos that Ivan was doing saying, hey, I have a 3D printer. Does anybody need a hand? I can, I can print one for them. Uh, so what John did is he developed a kind of map that would show people uh, that had 3D printers um, where they were. And then people that needed a hand, needed a device, could contact those 3D printers and work with them to get a hand or a finger or an arm or whatever they needed 3D printed. And that's kind of how Enable was started. And what is Enable now? It's a global distribution of people with 3D printers, with uh, 3D scanners, uh, all sorts of um, techniques and technologies that they have available to them. It's teachers, it's retired engineers, it's current engineers, it's doctors, it's art professors, art teachers, um, stay-at-home moms, stay-at-home dads. It's all sorts of people. Anybody can be a member of Enable and these little uh, pins that you see on this represent the global distribution of people that have registered with Enable. Now, there's no central authority that governs what Enable does. Um, there is a group of people that do try to provide rules and regulations to make sure that we're doing things safely. Uh, but because there's no central kind of authority, Enable is a little bit like herding cats. So it, it's a little, little crazy to get involved, uh, but there are uh, nice, clear workflows to, to help you to get an enabled device if you need one. So uh, what's the difference between working with a professional versus enabled person, enabled trained volunteer? So professional prosthetists, they are medically trained. So you know they know what they're doing. They have safe and rigorous clinical testing. They're gonna be probably pretty expensive without insurance. 
uh, and they do have commercial and profit motiva motivations uh, that come into play that they have to consider when they're treating people. Uh, repeat visits and training are often necessary for success, uh, but they are kind of a one-stop shop. You can get everything you need from the professional prosthetist, hopefully. And they are starting to use 3D printing in their practices. And their 3D printers are really no different than the ones that an Enable volunteer would use, except they've been kind of uh, idealized to printing prosthetics. Uh, whereas the Enable volunteers are all using kind of desktop 3D printers that you can buy for yourself. Uh, typically an Enable volunteer will have no medical training. Uh, we form chapters usually. Uh, some of those chapters are at universities like mine where you will have some kind of maybe potential uh, researcher that's involved in the process, or I work with our physical therapy department to make sure that we're doing things as medically safe as we can. Uh, but nothing that an Enable volunteer is typically medically, does is typically medically validated. So you are using Enable devices at your own risk. And they are uh, just 3D printed pieces that we kind of snap together. There are fancier designs that use screws. Uh, there are designs that use myoelectrics and motors, uh, but everything is really use at your own risk. But uh, on the other side of things, there's no cost for this. There's no commercial or profit motivation come, that comes into play when dealing with Enable. Uh, everything is done free of charge for anybody that needs something. Uh, repeat visits and training are often necessary for success in this case as well. Um, a volunteer isn't going to be able to create a prosthetic that's going to work better than a professional prosthetist in a one-stop, one thing, and you're done. Um, professionals need practice, and they need to provide you with devices and maybe tweak those devices. Same thing is going to happen with an Enable volunteer uh, doing a 3D printed kind of prosthetic. But the nice part about the 3D printing is we can rapidly iterate. We can rapidly change things. Um, and another thing with Enable, it's not a one-stop shop. You need to partner with a healthcare provider, your general practice doctor, your prosthetist, to make sure that what you are using is not causing harm to you. Uh, your Enable volunteer typically is not gonna be qualified to tell you if this is hurting you. So you're gonna to have to be on top of that with a, with a 3D printed prosthetic. So what does Enable do? What we're most known for is building superhero hands. So that's something like this. This is a very popular design. This is called the Phoenix hand. And the way these devices work, if you have uh, are, are missing your fingers, you can uh, put your palm inside of this 3D printed palm. We can provide a little mesh that covers this. And then when you bend your wrist, that pushes against the little mesh so that you can actually actuate this hand. So this one has been kind of uh, organized so that uh, I can use it. Uh, with my fingers so I can grab this bar. Uh, if you didn't have fingers, you'd have a little mesh here. And when you bend, that will close the fingers. And that gives you a general grasping ability. So you can have uh, a grossly functional hand. And we'll talk about how functional this actually is and compare it to some commercial prosthetics. And this is the basic design behind any enabled device that you're typically going to get. They all kind of work the same way. You have some usually a little bit of elastic. So there's elastic here that makes the fingers spring back into place. And that elastic is actually dental rubber bands from if you've ever had braces. Uh, there are 3D printed pins that pin everything together. Uh, and then some strings that attach to this little tensioner. When you bend, those strings pull on the fingers and cause it to close. And then when you release that tension, the elastic causes the hand to open back up. So that's one design. Uh, we're very well known for these superhero style hands. Uh, different kinds of hands as well. You can go more realistic. So we have a more realistic design, but it still works the same way, right? We still have a uh, string that ties to the back. And then when you bend your wrist, that actually closes the fingers and closes the hand. And then when you release with this kind of hand, you've got a different kind of material. So whereas normally the plastic that most enabled devices use is quite hard, like a Lego brick, this is like a soft Lego brick. So this is actually squishy. It's actually bendy. It's a material called Ninja Flex. Um, and we'll show you more about Ninja, Ninja Flex in a moment. Other things we do, we create task specific devices. Uh, I, in my lab, we've created a device for helping uh, a child uh, hold a trumpet. We've created uh, bike grips, violin holders. Uh, basically, if somebody needs to accomplish a task, 3D printing can help you create a device that will let you do that. And this is where I see a lot of uh, potential for members of the amputee community to kind of create their own devices, create their own ideas. Uh, we also try to create culturally appropriate prosthetics. 
So not everybody wants to have a superhero hand. So we try to create more realistic things. So we have a realistic kind of um, hand. Uh, looks much more realistic. Uh, and we can do this in, in realistic skin tones as well so that it's not all superhero based. Uh, and there's elastic inside of these little uh, fingers that again, allow you to have the fingers bounce uh, based on returning after you uh, apply some tension to this back string. Okay. And we can do this in the form of a hand or in the form of something like an arm. So here we have an arm where the uh, actual motion, instead of bending your wrist, this would be for somebody that had uh, an amputation below the elbow. We have a 3D printed socket. And then when you bend your elbow, that will cause the tension that will cause the fingers to close. So bending the elbow is the motion that causes the tension on the arms. And they all basically work with that same uh, uh, basic principle. Other kinds of devices we have, we also have cosmetic kind of devices. So this is a NinjaFlex 3D printed hand. This is made from a 3D scan uh, of a hand and then um, kind of carved out space for this individual's residual limb. We 3D scan the residual limb. So that what we can do is we can use this scan to tell if our device is going to fit. So we go through some iterations to get a hand that this uh, individual can actually wear as a cosmetic uh, device. Okay, so we can we can customize that uh, in the matter of a couple, uh, probably about a day to to do the design and printing of that. And then we also have moved into myoelectric designs, so designs that you control with motors. Uh, this is an example of just an exoskeleton that we would do, and you can have various control ways. This one in particular is hooked up to a cell phone, so I can control it by hitting a little button on my cell phone. Okay. So those are the kinds of devices and things that Enable does. Um, and you can see there's lots of different types of devices. We've got cosmetic hands, we've got bionic hands, we've got arms, uh, we've got customized devices. Uh, we've even got insoles for feet, uh, lots of different things that you can do with 3D printing. But the big question is, Does the, do these things work? Do these devices work? And can volunteers make a positive impact on uh, primarily upper limb prosthetics? Uh, and maintain this completely open source, right? We give everything away for free. So what have we learned over the past kind of six years that I've been doing this and then, then prior years to that as well? Uh, well, we've, we've got a sense of scale of the challenge that we have. We have about 2.4 million upper limb amputees in developing countries, and only about 5% of those have adequate prosthetic access. So Enable is coming in to try to try to help with this. There are not enough prosthetics or prosthetists to meet this need. So we have to kind of find good ways to do it using alternative techniques and methods. Uh, transradial amputation uh, at the forearm, that's 50% of all upper limb loss. Um, so that's that's kind of the cases that we can kind of uh, help with uh, at this point. Uh, we recognize abandonment is a big issue. Thirty five percent for myoelectric. They're too complicated or they're unreliable or you get sweaty or something breaks and you can't fix it or it's just plain too expensive. Uh, and then forty five percent for body powered. Either um, your muscles are too weak to use them or it's exhausting to use or it's uncomfortable. It doesn't fit right. So we're exploring uh, kind of hybrid designs that we can open source that have some electrical components and some uh, body powered components. Uh, and what 3D printing does is it offers um, what I call an assured solution. So it's affordable because 3D printers are, are relatively inexpensive as other materials. And I'll talk about that in a moment. The sensitive. So uh, our volunteers are very sensitive to the needs of, of the individual user and 3D printing lets us be very specific with what we're making. We can customize everything. Uh, and the techniques that we use and the tools that we use, they're all very user friendly. They're open source, so freely available for anybody to use and learn. And uh, 3D printers are, are pretty rapid and robust devices. Uh, another name for 3D printing is called rapid prototyping because we, we can iterate very quickly which is good when you're trying to make uh, a prosthetic because it does need to be hyper customized to some extent to, to have it fit well. Uh, and then the solution needs to be kind of equipment free. So we try to use uh, everything 3D printed. So if you have a 3D printer uh, and something breaks uh, in your device, then you can just 3D print a replacement for it. So we don't have lots of customized hardware, which would increase the costs for uh, a device itself. So 
all of those items added up together means that our products are deliverable to the end user, to anybody that needs to use one of these. Uh, and does this work? So how are we actually using this? So this is an example of a young boy named Amos in Uganda. He got one of the first uh, 3D printed uh, unlimited arms, which is still quite popular. Uh, but what we found was it was a little bit too big for him. And uh, he didn't like the color because it kind of stood out a little bit. So design is rapidly evolving in 3D printing, especially in the Enable community, constantly creating new hand designs. So we went from this kind of more cartoony looking design to this much more realistic design and much uh, more appropriate skin color uh, and much more appropriately sized so that he could actually use this uh, much more effectively. So we learned that it, it kind of takes a, a, a lot of iterating to, to make a device that will work. What it also takes is a lot of community. So this is a Enable chapter called Gimme5. They're based in Colombia. Uh, and what they do is they provide prosthetic devices, but they do it with big camps. So they invite families uh, on specific days of the month, have them all come at the same time, fit everybody and have them meet each other uh, and kind of interact within a limb difference community so that they could actually see that they're not alone uh, and kind of get strategies from other families on how to use these devices uh, and all provide uh, feedback uh, in large amounts to help improve the designs that, that are available. And again, all these devices, they're all 3D printed and all open source. So anybody can, can download the plans and print these. Uh, what we learned in Haiti was one size doesn't fit all. So you don't have just one design. Uh, they took Enable hands, they were very excited, uh, some of the earliest Enable members, to take superhero hands down to Haiti uh, to try to help uh, with the limb difference community down there. And what they found was, was they were considered voodoo hands. They were considered kind of taboo because they looked very cartoony. So what they needed was something more realistic. So they created this cosmetic kind of device. Uh, again, we can now create cosmetic devices using similar technologies and techniques. So Cosmesis, that opened up a new area and trying to make our devices not just cartoony, but also realistic looking. This or realistic looking, um, uh, the most recent design kind of, right? So this is all cartoony colored, uh, but it looks much more realistic than some of uh, the earlier Enable designs. You kind of have the same kind of look as a hand. It's very trim. It's not super bulky. Uh, so it kind of um, melts away into the user that's actually using it. It, it it doesn't stand out so much. So that's good for, for some uh, countries where, or some individuals that don't wanna stand out. Uh, what we found with uh, Enable Sierra Leone in Africa, there was a big amputee camp uh, and to help them, uh, first we, they took the uh, arms to them in the kind of cartoony colors and realized, no, they don't want that. We need to redesign it and have these kind of dark, darker skin tone arms. Uh, and what they also found was they needed to not only provide these 3D printed devices, but also provide solutions for the individuals in, in the, the region. So what they did is they built a whole workshop. They built a workshop for these uh, individuals in the amputee camp to 3D print their own devices uh, and to kind of uh, solve some of their problems. One of the interesting problems that they solved in Sierra Leone were well, what was that a lot of the amputees, even with these prosthetic arms, they had trouble picking stuff off off the ground because they couldn't get the right leverage. They couldn't kind of position their bodies correctly to do so. So the solution was use the workshop and build tables and start putting things on tables. And then they could get the proper leverage and they could pick stuff up and move stuff around. So that, that kind of helped a lot with, with uh, Enable Sierra Leone, realizing you can teach people, provide them skills uh, on how to use their own local resources to solve their own uh, issues. Uh, and then in Pakistan, uh, a group of enablers known as Grip3D, uh, they realized that this design, the split hook was, was really popular uh, and really functional, uh, but what people wanted was something that was more cosmetic. So one of our Enable volunteers, uh, a retired engineer by the name of Skip Meets, he created uh, something called the gripper thumb. And this gripper thumb is very, very useful. Uh, it kind of functions like the split hook, but it looks like an actual hand. So it's trying to bring the cosmetic uh, uh, kind of look 
and combine that with the function of this split hook. So we get something that's functional and cosmetic looking. Uh, so that's what enable has done, but, but what does enable need and what can enable be? And, and do these things actually work? Is this worth even continuing? Well, what we need are medical professionals to help us out, prosthetist technicians to advise us to make sure that we're doing things correctly. Some enablers have that in-house. So I've got that through my uh, physical therapy department that I uh, collaborate with. Uh, other enablers are, are just volunteers working out of their garages or elementary school students working with their teachers. So they need uh, some medical uh, advice. Um, we need designers, people to make these designs, people to make parametric CAD designs. So those are the designs that scale well, scale nicely to get to different sizes, uh, create uh, body powered models and mod models and to improve fit. That's what we really need more than everything else um, is, is how do we get the fit correct and get a nice, good, um, uh, comfortable prosthetic for people that need it or task specific device. Uh, we need electronics experts to help us with creating myoelectric designs. These electronic designs that, that there's, there's a thirst for and, and people want, but they're, they're complicated. So we need to simplify them enough that we can do it for a low cost, but not so much that it becomes uh, either unsafe or non-functional. Uh, we need engineers to understand biomechanics. So how is the body moving? How are the muscles working? Uh, we want to make sure that we don't cause overuse injuries. Um, bending your wrist like this, this is not the power grip that you usually get. So to close the hand, uh, usually to get your most powerful grip, you actually bend your wrist backwards. This is, this is the power grip from the muscle muscles that you have in the arm. Uh, bending it forward, um, that's, that's not as natural. So, so how do we redesign things to, to kind of take advantage of those biomechanics? Uh, and then we need users. We need people that want to test things, that want to try something out and are willing to say, hey, this is horrible, uh, but this is how I think you can fix it and, and provide ideas and be willing to test these things and iterate. So that's what we really need. We need testing and assessing. So this is what we started doing in my lab a lot. Uh, we started to try to test these and figure out, are these devices good enough uh, or do we need to improve them? And if so, how? So what we've done is something called the box and block test, uh, where you measure how many blocks you can move from one side of a box into another side of a box in the span of a minute. Uh, and we've done testing with this uh, using prosthetic emulators. So that's something like... You see a, a very fancy, uh, large, bulky one uh, in the picture, but we also have uh, a 3D printed one. So this one allows somebody that has a uh, full hand, full use of their hand to actually test this 3D printed version. So we can uh, simulate uh, how these hands work uh, using this emulator. And we use this device to test and see how do enable devices compare to something that you would get from a prosthetic provider. And these are the average scores that we see from our designs, the Team Unlimited Phoenix, the Phoenix version two, that is uh, this design right here. We move about uh, between about 14 or 15 blocks within the span of a minute. With the uh, Osprey hand, we move about 12 blocks in a minute. With the Raptor Reloaded hand, the very first kind of 3D printed designs, we move about seven blocks within the span of a minute. And this is spread across, uh, average out numbers across about, um, about 20 different volunteers. So is this good? Um, we need a basis for comparison. So what we do, uh, we compare it to an unaffected limb. So with my hand, I could move about 70 blocks in the span of a minute. When we look at commercial prosthetics, using emulators, doing the exact same experiment that we did. The lowest performing commercial prosthetics, uh, they'll move about 18 blocks in a minute. So that's about what we're getting with our enable designs. So our designs built by a bunch of hobbyists and freely available for anybody, they perform about the same uh, in this particular test as a commercial device that you would buy. Uh, high performing prosthetic devices uh, that you can buy, this is about 30 blocks per minute. And that's what we wanna try to get. We wanna try to mimic the functionality of the highest performing devices before we aim for this 70 blocks per minute. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we come up with new designs. Perhaps this design is the answer, this gripper thumb design that works like the split hook. Um, we need to test this and we need people to test this on. This design, this kinetic hand from Matt 
Botel, I believe the name is. Uh, very, very cosmetic looking, but is this actually more functional too? Um, we need to test this. We need to test this design, see how many blocks we can move with this kind of more cosmetic looking um, uh, design. So we need to improve these designs. We need to compare and we need to get data. So what is the Enable looking like in, like in the future? Enable is looking at cosmetic devices, task of specific devices, uh, maybe starting to explore prosthetic legs and how we can do that safely, uh, and maybe doing some cosmetic devices. Um, so what we've got now is just a brief little video that will that will walk us through some of these designs uh, that we have available. So here's our global map of all the volunteers. This is recent as of last year. Uh, you can see we do finger designs. So this is the Nick finger created by um, a gentleman named Nick Brooks. This is the flexi hand made with flexible filament. There's the Phoenix hand. Here's the body powered arm. You can see the motion is linked to the elbow and there's a more cosmetic looking body powered arm with very fine grasping. And then here you see he's activating it by pulling that elbow and able to write. Here we see a time lapse of creating a cosmetic device. And this cosmetic device is made by 3D scanning uh, a hand. And we can do those 3D scanning and convert that into a file that we then 3D print. We do grip testing to see how strong these hands are. Uh, we do emulator testing to see if you can actually use it to take a drink of water. It's a very, very brave student uh, actually able to drink out of uh, a bottle of water with one of these devices. Um, we do simple bionics. So this is using that gripper thumb and hooking it up to a motor so that it's a very simple electric device. We work on virtual myoelectric training. So she is wearing a myoelectric armband that is reading the muscle pulses going down her arm. Uh, and we can set this up similarly. Uh, here we can see she gave me a virtual fist bump. So she makes a fist and the virtual hand makes a fist. And then we see some advanced kind of bionic designs. Um, this is uh, a design from Open Bionics that we've kind of adapted into with using our own coding and using our own wiring to, uh, again, have it linked up with this myoelectric sensor, and we can control this uh, electronic hand. Okay. This is a student, Megan Gagnon. Uh, then we have modular arms. So this is part of something called the NIOP, the No Insurance Optimized Prosthetic, being designed by Nate Monroe, uh, himself an amputee. Uh, and he's pioneering uh, full arms. Uh, and then since it is an international effort, this is um, some video from Humanos 3D who provides uh, prosthetic devices all over the world. And you can see some of the extremes that they go to to do that. So where do we go from here? Uh, what can you do uh, with, with your own tools? So the tools that I use in my lab, I use a very wide variety of 3D printers. I've got um, SLA machines, MSLA machines, which use kind of a liquid resin. That would be this one right here. And then I have FDM machines, which is fused deposition modeling. Uh, this uses a filament, basically like a Lego brick. I have more expensive printers, something like a $2,500 Luzbot printer, or something that's more um, affordable, uh, the Prusa printer, uh, 749 for this one. It's about eight cubic inches that it can print. And then this $349 printer is about seven cubic inches called the Prusa Mini. Uh, and you could print probably any device that you would want using this uh, Prusa Mini 3D printer, about $350 to purchase that. And then the materials, uh, the materials, it's a spool of filament. It's basically a bit like Lego brick that you've wrapped into a piece of spaghetti and wrapped around onto a spool. One of these spools will make between three and five devices, depending on the device that you're making, if you're making a hand or an arm, and there are different types of filament that you can use. So the typical one we use is a PLA or a PETG. That's this harder kind of material that doesn't really bend very well. Um, that is gonna run you about $20 for this spool that would print three to five devices. Something that's more flexible, that's gonna have more give. Something like that with this kind of floppier filament. Uh, I love the name of it, it's called Ninja Flex. Uh, and this is a flexible filament that will give you that kind of more flex in your 3D prints. Uh, that will run you about $40 for a spool of that. Uh, and then you have resin, 
um, which you can 3D print with. Uh, it's a bottle, it runs about $60 to probably print uh, one or two devices. So the resin is a little bit more expensive to actually purchase the materials. Uh, and there are a little bit more safety considerations with resin. So what I would suggest if you were gonna start trying to do 3D printing yourself, uh, I'd get one of these FDM machines or use them at your library and use these kinds of um, uh, regular filament based plastics. Some tools that you can use. So this is all freely available. Uh, and there are links at the end of the presentation where you can where you, where you can download these. Autodesk Tinkercad. Tinkercad is a 3D design software. It's basically like virtual Legos. You drag and drop shapes uh, and combine them to build up whatever kind of design you might want. This gripper thumb right here was designed entirely in Tinkercad. Uh, and you can see here that he's kind of optimizing the design so that it can pick up uh, this cylinder, which is the size of a can. So a typical food uh, beverage container. Autodesk Tinkercad also has a circuits uh, portion where you can use it to control uh, circuits. You can use like mini little computers to create electronic designs or electronic devices that can do whatever you need them to do. We also have MIT App Inventor. So this is a way that you can take your Tinkercad circuits and you can control them from a cell phone. So you can make a cell phone based um, prosthetic or assistive device. Uh, right now, this MIT App Inventor, very easy to use, but it does only work with Android. So you would be limited to an Android device, not, not iOS. Uh, and then finally, Autodesk Fusion 360. This is a full on CAD or computer aided design package. It will do all kinds of modeling that you might want to do if you really dive deep into creating these kinds of things. Uh, this is how you would make parametric designs that you could customize uh, based on typing and measurements uh, of an individual's uh, limb. So I have useful links for all of these things. So here's a link to Prusa, Prusa Shop where you can buy some of these 3D printers, uh, any cubic where you can buy some slightly cheaper uh, FDM printers or resin printers, Tinkercad 3D design software, Tinkercad circuit design software. Both come with tutorials that will teach you exactly how the software works. Uh, again, it's like digital Legos, lots of fun just to create things. Uh, MIT App Inventor 2, where you can create apps to control your um, assistive devices and Fusion 360, where you can really customize even further uh, by typing in measurements and, and really dive down deep into this 3D design world. So those are the tools that you can use to create your own things that you want to accomplish to make your life easier. Maybe you have an idea for a way to create a device that would make it easier to button up your jacket or tie your shoes. You can create that now, or you can talk to some enable volunteer and an enable volunteer can work with you to create it. So that brings us to our main enable resources and kind of the wrap up of all of this. Uh, to get started, you can visit enablingthefuture.org. This is a website that uh, hosts a blog with lots of stories about 3D printing and how to get involved with Enable. Uh, if you want to actually get involved in the community, we have a hub, the Enable Hub. So this hub will take you to that uh, actual resource where you have listings for all the devices that we have, how to get started as a new member, how to get started in bionic designs. There's a new uh, segment of that, how to get started in designing devices for animals. Uh, so lots of great information, information on this Enable Hub. If you need a device or want a device, we have a matching system for that. You can get matches if you want to make a device for somebody else, or you can get matched. So that happens on Enable Web Central. You can just visit this website and that will help you out. You can get uh, any kind of device that you want. And there's even a library there of devices that have been sent into a central repository. So let's say you saw this hand and you said, that would be perfect for me. I want that. You could go to Enable Web Central and you could say, you could find this device and say, I want that and Enable would send it to you. Uh, and then if you're a new member and wanna get started, wanna get onboarded, there is a uh, brand new link uh, fresh as of this morning where you can log in uh, and there's a new welcome page to make it very easy and very clear cut for how to get involved with Enable. If you ever have any questions, you can visit any of these websites or you are welcome to contact me at ebubar at marymount.edu. Again, I'm the uh, associate professor and chair and head of en engineering at Marymount. 
in Arlington, Virginia. So if you're local to me, I'm happy to help you. If you're not local to me, I'm happy to help you and send things your way. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them at any time. Um, but other than that, we'll call that a day. Okay, I see a question in the chat um, from Arena Bird. Uh, she is above the elbow. Do we make anything that goes up that high? Uh, I have not personally made uh, an above elbow device, but we do have one uh, that I'm aware of. And again, we can get to this from the uh, enable uh, hub. So here's the hub and here's all the devices that we have. Let's see all the devices. And this would be under the NIOP. So on the NIOP, we do have an above elbow um, shoulder design. So this shoulder design, uh, you can see, uh, hasn't been uh, thoroughly tested. So. To make one of these, uh, ideally, uh, we try to find an enable volunteer that was local to you, Arena, uh, and we would actually uh, try to have them work with you to make the device. Uh, it's nice to have a local because then they can iterate a lot quicker. Um, if you can't find somebody locally to you, um, I'm happy to help you out. Uh, we can we can create these devices in my lab. Uh, it's not that that hard, that not that difficult to do, uh, but understand it will be a lot of testing probably, a lot of back and forth to try something, see if it works, and then to uh, try something again or, or kind of um, iterate uh, probably two or three times at least uh, to get you something that would be functional. Um, how much does it weigh? We're working on bringing the weight down. Uh, right now, the weight of the exo shoulder is, is comparable to, cosmet to commercial devices uh, is what I'm told. Uh, I haven't weighed them myself. Uh, they do feel a little heavy to me when I've, when I've held them before, um, but we can bring that weight down uh, a, a decent amount. Um, have we created anything that helps? Uh, another question from the chat, uh, since I know there, there's a little bit of a lag. Uh, have we created anything that helps with putting hair up in a ponytail? Uh, nothing that I know of, um, but again, we are happy to try to create something. Uh, if you have ideas, um, that's, that's what we're here for. Uh, you can try to create it yourself uh, using this design software that, uh, tools or get in touch with Enable. Um, if you go to that Enable hub, uh, Enable Web Central. So we'll show you this. So I've logged in. So I have an account here. 
so you can log in with your with a with an email address. Uh, I just use my Google email, and when I pursue uh, proceed, uh, here is where for people seeking a device, this is where you can make a request. So if you wanted an above uh, the elbow device, you can request it here. So here is some information about how that process works, and if you accept that. Uh, you kind of type in your name uh, and it will ask you several questions uh, and then once you get through this um, we can get you started to start getting you a device uh, most of these i believe are, are set up for uh, hands but you can uh, kind of mark this other and describe what you would want so you would be able to describe uh, i want something to help me with my ponytail um, or uh, i need a full arm uh, and we could get started with matching you up with somebody that could help you to get that. Uh, so next question in the chat from Alexander is, are the NIOP devices using the same modular connection as the industry ones, like OSER and Autobox? So I believe a lot of the OSER and Autobox are, are using kind of magnetic connections, uh, and we don't do that. Um, but they are using standard size kind of mechanical connections. So if it's a bolt, we're using the same size bolts uh, or, or screws that you use for screwing things in. So some might be compatible with, with OSER and auto box sockets. Uh, I know that the NIOP uh, developer, uh, Nate Monroe, uh, being an amputee himself is very cognizant of that and is trying to bring the weight down and make it as modular and, and plug and play as possible with, with other, other um, options, especially for sockets, because that's, that's an area that's tough for volunteers to do properly. Uh, how is the 3D printed arm able to be used in real life? Um, so what I found a lot of, uh, I've, I've made devices for kids a lot. Uh, this is a question from Marianne. Uh, how is a 3D printer arm able to, able to be used in real life? Um, I found that it's it's a fist bump device, first and foremost, for kids. Uh, whenever I make a device for a child, the first thing they do is they fist bump. Um, one of the biggest benefits of the Enable Hands, uh, at least in the, in the U.S., has been uh, kind of more psychosocial. So kids um, occasionally are shy. Um, and, and want to hide uh, a, a limb difference uh, and the superhero hands and try to empower them to show it off and show, hey, look, I'm Captain America. Uh, you only get problems when you have one kid that's Captain America and another that's that's Thanos, and then they start fighting. Um, so that's, that's the big kind of social benefit. Um, as far as functionality, there are uh, individuals that have, um, that, that use it to pick up cups, pick up glasses, uh, they use it to button up their shirts, uh, hold a brush, um, very basic gross kind of grasping abilities. Um, but it takes a lot of practice. Uh, it's, it's, not as, it's not easy to use, uh, I, I would say, uh, in my experience and from the feedback that I've gotten from individuals that are using them. Uh, they largely use them um, a little bit as a fashion accessory um, to kind of have something else to wear when they go out. Um, and that's a nice advantage of the 3D printed versions because you can hyper customize them. You can make whatever colors you want, uh, whatever designs you want. Um, and where places are starting to get really fancy. Uh, so this is going off of uh, Marianne's uh, another question. Are the 3D arms heavy to use? I have a B bionic arm and it is heavy. Uh, I've seen that described in, in a lot of places that, that the myoelectric devices are ridiculously uh, heavyweight because uh, they're they're machined out of metal. They have very heavy duty machinery inside of them, heavy batteries. Um, so that they are quite heavy. Uh, the 3D printed arms, that does decrease the weight a significant amount. There are two designs that I'm aware of that are 3D printed that are um, lighter weight, I believe. There's the Open Bionics Hero Arm. So we'll load that up. So this is not made by Enable, um, but it is inspiration for some Enable designs. We are working on a Bionics platform to allow enablers to more easily develop Bionic designs. And ours is uh, the one my lab is developing is based entirely on this Hero Arm. 
uh, Open Bionics has kind of open sourced their information. Um, so you can see a, a rough prototype of what the kind of outline of it will look like. And we're trying to make it small, right? I know that's a big issue that I've seen in the literature, at least. Um, uh, I, people in the, in, the, in the room can correct me, um, as, as you probably have more experience than I do. But size of prosthetic devices, uh, they tend to be large. Uh, they tend to be, it seems like every single one has like a man-sized hand uh, and nothing's a little bit smaller for like my hand's a little bit smaller or, or a female's hand or child's hand is a little bit smaller. So we need smaller bionic designs. Uh, so that's what we're targeting here. This is the average size of an adult female hand. Um, and this is, this is what we'll design from this kind of open bionics kind of viewpoint. Open Bionics hand, I believe, is one of the lightest weight uh, and lowest cost bionic designs. I think it's about $10,000 through um, a prosthetist, uh, but you do have to go through a prosthetist to get this device. The other thing, the other uh, organization that's relatively new in recent years uh, is Unlimited Tomorrow. Uh, they are, uh, according to their website, they're about $8,000. Uh, what they do is they work entirely remotely with you. So their device is 3D printed. This is 3D printed on a very um, high quality industrial grade 3D printer. So not something that a typical Enable volunteer would have. So this is a little different than Enable, but it is still able to uh, provide you with a 3D printed uh, prosthetic limb. It works with Myoelectrics and they will work entirely virtually with you. So they will send you a 3D scanner to get a scan of your limb. Uh, they will design a socket for you to wear, uh, some sensors, myoelectric sensors, and they will work with you remotely uh, through mail to get you a device that will work for you. So you could uh, also look into Unlimited Tomorrow to get a lighter weight limb or work with some of the enablers that are creating these uh, myoelectric kind of bionic designs. Uh, just know that working with an enable volunteer, you're not going to have a lot of um, medical advice from that particular enable volunteer and and it's going to take a bit longer uh so i believe unlimited tomorrow takes about a year to get a device uh you might be waiting one or two years before you get something functional from somebody that's creating it from scratch for enable uh as we're figuring out these bionic designs um so yeah i think the open bionics uh hero arm is much lighter the true limb from Unlimited Tomorrow is much lighter, uh, and anything that Enable comes out with um, is is going to try to be much lighter than than the commercial arms because we know those are really really heavy. Um, I see another question. I'm looking for something to help me hold the paddle of my kayak. Partial fingers on a right hand, fingers about half an inch long. Hand does not go all around the paddle because the web between the thumb and pointer finger. Thoughts on that? So yeah, I think I think that's a situation where three D printing. So that's a question from uh, Vala Hall Grimson in the chat. Uh, I think that's a case where three D printing would be great. Uh, I have created a custom device for for a little boy that had symbodactylism, uh, so that he could hold his hockey stick. So I think something similar would work for holding the paddle of your kayak. Uh, what we would need to, to do that, it might be a um, kind of potentially providing you with the, the finger that was seen very briefly in the video I was showing, the Nick finger, which we can find on the uh, device catalog. So as we scroll through... So again, there is a little bit of a lag, so so you'll be getting your answers 30 seconds after I talk about them. But this Nick finger has um, a little socket that you would put over your partial fingers, uh, and then it would have some extension uh, and some uh, kind of wrist strap that would connect it to your wrist to provide the tension that you need to actually close that finger. So this Nick finger can provide a partial uh, finger prosthetic, and I could imagine we can convert uh, something like the Nick finger or something like this bike handle adapter. So let's go to this link where we have the files for it. So this, so this is a little socket 
and then attached to that is the thing that you attach to your bike. We could probably create something that would uh, attach to your uh, actual handle for your kayak and then a kind of ball and socket uh, that you could maybe slide your hand into or Velcro your hand to to kind of connect it uh, in kind of a ball and socket joint uh, so that you could have something to help hold the paddle of your kayak. Um, so yeah, I think something like that is infinitely doable. Uh, I would say just shoot me an email or uh, go to Web Central and describe what you need there. So either email eboobar at marymont.edu or check out Enable Web Central and say you need a custom device. It's interesting. I have no idea how many people there because uh, all I'm seeing is two participants right now. Uh, I see another question popping up. Is there any advice to give amputees about using Enable? So uh, again, I think my big advice is, is, is part of this presentation is to keep this little chart in mind. We'll scroll back up. the difference between enable and a prosthetist. So the prosthetist, they are medically trained. They have gone through years of training to be able to help you with your limb difference. Um, so they have, they have the training, right? They are, they are formally, this is their profession. This is their job. Uh, so it's the safest and the most rigorous way for you to get something that will work. Now, uh, I do understand that, that, that could be expensive, um, that could be prohibitively expensive. Uh, there might be some profit motive there um, that, that can create problems. So that's where Enable can potentially come in. Enable can, uh, can help you. We can try to create things to the best of our abilities, but the biggest thing to keep in mind is that everything that you use from Enable is use at your own risk. Everything that we do, it's, it's all experimental. We test it as well as we can, we, we are, uh, we're very safe in how we do things and how we 3D print stuff, but it is, it is um, a, a test, right? You, you are testing something brand new. Um, so you wanna keep that in mind when working with any Enable volunteer. Um, another thing to keep in mind is, is occasionally um, volunteers, because they are volunteering their time with Enable, um, they might become busy with life uh, and they might, uh, this doesn't often happen, but that they might lose track of your case, or they might be really excited to help, uh, and they might try things, uh, and they might not be able to help. So it might need to go to another Enable volunteer. So, you, so it might take a little while before you find the right fit, the right person to work with you to, to help you out. Uh, but keep trying, and, and you will find the right Enable person to help. There, there are thousands of us all over the world, uh, and, and some of them, some, some of us very, very um, uh, well-skilled, some of them. Uh, I can repeat my email address and I will scroll to the very end of the show so you can see this as well. So there's a question in the chat. Uh, can you please repeat my email? Um, so these main enable resources, my email again is ebubar at marymount.edu. And this uh, QR code, you can actually scan this. And if you scan this, this will take you to this actual slide deck. So you get this uh, whole presentation. So you can have all these slides and all of this information for you. Uh, question of how to get involved as an amputee to test arms. So uh, Enable currently doesn't have a central repos repository to do that. But if there's interest, if there's enough interest, uh, I can see putting something like that together. Um, so my suggestion would be to uh, go ahead and send me an email at ebubar. I'll put my email in the chat as well, ebubar at marymount.edu. And I will work with connecting anybody that wants to test devices uh, with either my lab or another lab that's more local to you that can help you with testing these things uh, and giving good feedback on how we can improve this. 
or how we can make devices the, that you need. So if that's all the questions, I will go ahead and I will turn off my camera and I will thank uh, the MPT Coalition for their time and thank all the uh, participants in, in the session. Um, let me know if you have any questions uh, through email, ebubar at marymonte.edu.